All of us have experienced failure in our lives. But the question is, how are you doing with that failure? How are you handling that failure? Failure is a very common theme in God's Word. Uh, We find Moses was a man who murdered an Egyptian, yet it was Moses that God had called to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt and on toward the promised land. We find following that in that experience that there was a woman named Rahab who was a prostitute, but yet God used her in a very unique moment in Israel's history to bring victory. We look at uh, the Apostle Paul, a man who was persecuting Christians, and yet he became the greatest missionary the world has ever known. But then we come to a guy like Peter. I think all of us can identify with Peter in many different ways if you've studied his life. And in the Bible, in John chapter 21, we're going to find how Jesus Christ dealt with Peter's failure. So if you will, open your Bibles to John chapter 21. We find that the Lord has been crucified. He's been raised from the dead. Over the next 40 days, he appears uh, to over 500. The Bible says, uh, Peter, I mean, uh, Paul writes about that in 1 Corinthians. uh, Makes it clear that that, uh, Christ is alive. And here Jesus is on the Sea of Galilee. He's uh, on on the shore of the Sea of the Galilee. And his disciples are there. And he has fixed breakfast for them. And the Bible says in chapter 21, verse 15, when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said to him, you know that I love you. Feed my lambs, he told him. A second time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, he said to him, you know that I love you. Shepherd my sheep, he told him. He asked him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved that he asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, do you know everything? Or you know everything. You know that I love you. Feed my sheep, Jesus said. I assure you, when you were young, you would tie your belt and walk wherever you wanted. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will tie you and carry you where you don't want to go. This is... Uh, predicting his death where he would be more than likely crucified on a cross. Tradition says that Peter was crucified upside down. He said this to signify by what kind of death he would glorify God. After saying this, he told him, follow me. Well, how did Jesus deal with Peter's failure? It really is the same way that he deals with our failures. And what are some things that we can see about dealing with our failures as we conclude this series of messages about life issues that we face. We face suffering, we deal with anger, we have problems at work, uh, we we, uh, have issues regarding our self-esteem and relationships, and here we look at dealing with the problem of failure and how to move on from that. Number one, only three points I want to make this morning. Number one, we need to look at our failures. We need to look at our failures. Here we find Jesus asked Peter a simple question. Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Now what happened? Why had Jesus asked Peter this question? Well, if you go back a few pages to John 13, let me read verse 36. They're in the upper room. Jesus has had the Lord's Supper with them, has said that someone's going to betray them. Uh, Peter looks to John, the Bible says, the disciple who loved Jesus and trying to find out who is it. He's mouthing the words, literally, who is it that's done this? And John asked, Lord, is it I? And it's a great question. A lot to be said about that one question. John knew his potential to sin, his potential to fail. And here we find that in this upper room discourse, verse 36, Lord, Simon Peter said to him, where are you going? Jesus answered, where I'm going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow later. Lord, Peter asked, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus replied, will you lay down your life for me? I assure you, a rooster will not crow until you have denied me three times. Then we find in Matthew 26, 33, Matthew records the conversation. Even if everyone runs away because of you, I will never run away. 
Peter says he'll die for Christ. Let me ask you a question. If you were in Syria or Iraq right now, and ISIS had your children, would you profess Christ or deny Christ? I mean, picture yourselves today. I received an email from someone who is there now and said they've just taken another town. They've already beheaded a hundred, and they're going for more. Right now, today, just because you say, I love Christ, they're losing their lives. Would be we willing to die? I think the bigger question is, am I willing to live for Christ? I think some would say, I'll, I'll, I'll die for Christ. And that's what Peter is saying, I'll die for Christ. But the real question for Peter was, will you live for me, Peter? Will you live for me? Well, in John 18, we find that Peter, after this great confession denies Christ three times. Luke 22, that account, verse 60 says this, immediately while he was still speaking, he had just denied and said, no, I don't know him. A rooster crowed. Then the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Luke is the only one that records this part of it. When he denied him the third time, the rooster crows, Peter and Jesus catch eyes. Think about that. So Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him, Before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. Now, what we know is that Jesus and Peter met privately before this scene on the Sea of Galilee. We find in Luke 24, 33 to 34, and also 1 Corinthians 15, uh, where Paul is listing those who saw Jesus. He specifically says Cephas or Peter had seen him. So we know that there was a private conversation, and more than likely, there was a conversation about his denial and that Peter had been restored privately. But what we find now is that there is a public denial, there is a public confession. I love you, Lord. Three times he has said that. Now there needs to be a public restoration. Peter needed to be, Jesus knew that Peter not only needed to be restored privately, with him, but he needed to be restored in front of the other disciples who heard Peter deny him. So we have this public restoration that is taking place. Sin should be dealt with only to the extent that it's known. In other words, those who know about my sin, I need to confess that to them. I need to ask forgiveness for them. I need restoration with them. Those outside of that circle don't need to know about it. Unless it's a very rare situation or circumstance. We don't need to be broadcasting that out to everybody. Other family members don't need to know about it. Just those who know. Those are the ones who need to understand what has happened. Jesus did not remind Peter of the details concerning his sin. He didn't say in front of everyone. Now Peter, let's talk about how you denied me and what you did. And how bad that was. And how you made me feel when you did that. Jesus didn't go into that. He just asked a simple question, which dealt with the root of his sin. Do you love me? If you really had loved me, Peter, you wouldn't have done that. So that's what Jesus is saying to each of us, that we need to look at our failure. And the real question we need to focus on is not what I did, but it's my heart. Do I really love Jesus Christ? Notice the first time Jesus asked this question, do you love me? He said, more than these. There's debate about that. Do you love me more than you love these men? It's a possibility. Or more than likely, do you love me more than these men love me? He didn't ask it, but really implied is, don't you remember, Peter, you said that you loved me so much that you would die for me, that you would never run away? But do you, do you really love me to the extent? Jesus doesn't address Peter's act, but his heart. But why? He knows that if his heart is right, then his repentance and his obedience will follow. And that's why Jesus speaks to our heart. He wants to know if the heart is right with him. If the heart is right, then our repentance and obedience will follow when we have failed him. Peter responds, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. What happens? Peter's aware that Jesus would still want Peter 
to follow Christ, even because of his sin. He, he, he loves me that much that he would forgive me, that he would restore me of my failure and want me to still love him and follow him. And that's what the Lord is saying to you this morning, that he loves you in spite of your failure. And he wants you to, to embrace the love that he has for you as you really come to understand how great his love is for you, that you love him all the more. Notice he uses this word love. Do you love me? And there's a play on words here. Some say you shouldn't make too much out of it, out of it but I do think there is a distinction. He says, Jesus, he said, Peter, do you love me? And the first two times he uses the word love in that question, it's the word agape. Do you have a spiritual love for me? Uh, an, an unconditional, a God kind of love for me? And Peter says, Lord, you know that I love you, phileo, not agape. You know that I love you as a friend. I, I love you emotionally. I love you passionately. And, 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 and then he, Jesus asked him again, do you love me agape? You know that I phileo, you know that I love you as a friend, Lord. And then the third time Jesus says, do you love me even as a friend? He changes the word. He, he, he lowers now to Peter's level. And he says, do you even love me that much? And he said, you know all things. You know that I, 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 I love you in that way. And what does Jesus do? He accepts Peter where he is. And he's going to take him at that level of love and help him understand the, the true love that God wants him to have. Look at your failure and ask if you really love Christ. And recognize that he loves you even as a sinner. And that ought to motivate you to love him all the more. But secondly, you look at your failure. You have to look at it. Now, Jesus doesn't, doesn't look at your failure in a condemning way. He's, he's looking at your failure in a way that he wants you to see your heart. and Where the real root of the problem is. But notice secondly, we need to learn from our failures. What life lessons can we learn from our failures. Rebecca Jordan has a, a, a great article about this. First of all, failure points out our weaknesses and our need for God. If we weren't failing, we would act as though we had no need for God, that we were our own God. And that's why Jesus said in John 15, 5, apart from me, you can do nothing. So the one thing I can learn is that I know that I, I, I failed and that failure has shown me how great my need is for Christ. Secondly, failure preaches powerful sermons. They can be great object lessons for others. Now, that's not why God does that, but that's a lesson that we can learn is that others can, can, can observe what I've done and how I have failed, and it can be a great object lesson. Derek Jeter just uh, is retiring from uh, playing with the Yankees, 20 years, 40 years of age, uh, great success in that position. But there was another Yankee many years ago, Mickey Mantle. 536 home runs, a three-time MVP in the American League, 12 pennants. He played in 12 World Series. Think of that. 12. If you get to play in one, it, it, it's amazing. Even if you make a major league team, it's, a, it, it's incredible. The odds of you doing that, 900 Ball players will be drafted this next year. 45 of those 900 will play one inning in the major leagues, at least one inning. The odds are incredible to play in 12 World Series. What was Mickey Mantle's statement at the end of all of that? He said, if you want a role model, don't follow my example. He had significant problems off the field. But late in life, he came to know Christ as his Lord and Savior. He came to understand the love that Christ had for him. In spite of his failure as an individual, all the success that world could give him, he still had failed. Failed miserably. But he said, don't, don't look at my life. I think today we can look at his life. See how God redeemed that life that had failed so greatly. Failure enables us to help others. It helps us understand their pain. It helps us to walk in their shoes. We don't want to experience the pain and the suffering of life and the failures of life. 
But in that failure, I'm able to identify with others. And when someone comes to me and say, Pastor, this has happened in my life, and if I have failed in that way, I'm able to say, I've been there. You can say, I've been there, and help them. Failure places in us a desire to succeed. That's what it should do. When you fail, do you constantly beat yourself up and say, if only I hadn't done that, I should have done better? Do you keep reliving the memories of your failure? Are you choosing to waller in your failure? The pain of breaking God's heart ought to move us through our sin to move on to success. No, this is not where I want to live. I have failed, but I do not want to stay here and live here. And you don't have to. You can move on, as I'll share in a minute. Failure moves us closer to the place God wants us. I watched recently a documentary about the Watergate scandal. It was an updated version. And many of you may know Chuck Colson by name of Prison Ministry Fellowship. But you may not know that he was uh, part of uh, Nixon's cabinet. And uh, he was indicted, and he spent time in prison. And it was while he was in prison that he came to know Christ. And as a result, God took him from where he was in Washington, D.C., to a prison to now have a ministry to those who are in prison And thousands upon thousands upon thousands have come to know Christ. God got him to the place where he really wanted him. Sometimes we don't understand how God is working in those failed things that are going on in our lives. But he's using that not to to beat us up, but to get us to where he wants us in life. And that's how I see it. This is part of the journey. This is part of the place. This is where I need to turn. And go another way than where I am right now because God has a better place for me. Failure can be redeemed. We all make mistakes, but our failures don't have to destroy us. And how we respond to our failures will determine whether they make us or whether they break us. And we see ourselves, we need to see ourselves as God sees us, where we learn to accept our failures, to move on and to live for Him dependent upon his supernatural power. Can you hear the words of the Lord Jesus saying to you, I know you're going to fail. I know you think that it may be the end, but it's not. And I'm not here to beat you up. I'm not here to relive that failure. I'm not here to, to punish you. I'm not here to, to make fun of you. I'm here to help you. And what you see as a failure is an opportunity for me to demonstrate my power. What you see as an imperfection is my opportunity for you to experience my grace. My grace. I've made it possible for you, for your failure to lead to success. The choice is up to you. That's what Jesus is saying to you right now in your failure. God has dealt with our sin redemptively, our failures redemptively. We need to do the same. And listen, that's the lesson we need to learn. He has dealt with it already redemptively. I need to deal with my failure redemptively and embrace Christ and his plan and his love for me. Now, the last thing we need to see, you need to look at your failure. You need to learn from your failure, but you need to leave your failure How did Peter leave his failure? Number one, God gave Peter an assignment. Verse 15, he said, feed my lambs. Verse 16, shepherd my sheep. Verse 17, feed my sheep. So, teach and tend. Feed and lead immature lambs and mature sheep believers. That's what I want you to do, Peter. So you need to see that Peter was an evangelist. The Gospels, in in, in definition of the word itself, means good news, a messenger, an evangelist. We get the word evangel from that. He was an evangelist, but now he becomes a shepherd. Now he cares and, and, and tends for the flock. And really that's all of us, the ministry. It's the model of discipleship that I share and I care. 
I, I help people come to know Christ, and then I help them grow in Christ. And both have to happen in order to be a disciple of Christ, to be a follower of Christ. It, 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 it's letting the seed that's been planted take root so that it's not just something that I say, it's something that I become, that Christ becomes my life. So that's our model of ministry, privately and also publicly as well. If we truly love Christ, we will leave our failure and our love of others. He gave Peter an assignment. He has an assignment for you. He has an assignment for you. God also gave Peter a direction. Notice he said, follow me in verse 19. Follow me. Why did, why did Peter fail? Because he stopped following Christ and he started following self. And if you want to leave your failure, you have to stop following self and start following Jesus Christ. That's why we failed. Every time we fail, we've no longer followed Christ. We have followed self and self always leads to failure. What I want always leads to failure. What I want to do always leads to failure. Versus, I need to follow Christ. And when I follow Christ, I'll always succeed. We always succeed. Another reason we fail is because we follow others. So important. We compare ourselves to others. We worry about what they think or what they do. We're jealous of other people and jealous of their success. We're jealous of what they have and what we don't have. Notice verse 20. Notice verse 20. So Peter turned around and saw the disciple Jesus loved, that's John, following them. That disciple was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and asked, Lord, who is the, who is the one that's going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about him? pointing to John if I want him to remain until I come Jesus answered what is that to you as for you follow me what did Jesus say Peter don't worry about John don't worry about what he's doing right now don't worry about my plan for him you worry about you you worry about what I'm asking you to do and all I'm asking you to do Peter is to follow me well it's a great lesson that we need, we need to stop following others. What about him? No, you follow me, and I'll take care of you. I'll take care of you. You just follow me. The way we leave our failure is to do what Christ tells us to do and follow him. You may have failed. You may have failed. But you're not a failure in Christ. You may have failed, but don't listen to the devil who says you are a failure. No, you have not experienced the ultimate failure if you're following Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I want you to bow your head and close your eyes for just a moment. There might be somebody here who would say, Pastor, I've never given my heart to Christ. I've never followed him, and I need to do so today. I know that, that I have sinned, and that's, that's the ultimate failure is recognizing that we have sinned. And so we can have that sin forgiven, and we have the opportunity for our lives to have purpose and meaning by following Christ. It's turning from our sin, turning from our failure, and turning to Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. So I invite you to come in just a few moments to do that. There are others who know the Lord, but you're stuck this morning in that place where you have failed. Listen, it's so easy to go there. It's easy for me to go there. It's just so easy to do that and to listen to the enemy. But Jesus is standing there with you asking you do you really love me if you love me here's your assignment here's what I want you to do but the biggest assignment is I want you to follow me and wherever he leads you is going to be the right place when he leads you there is the right time 
How he leads you there is the right way. Don't worry. Follow Christ. Leave the failure here and follow him. There might be others that God is leading you to join our fellowship this morning, to be part of a body of believers where we can help you and encourage you as you follow Christ. You help us. You may need to come and pray or talk with someone. I'll be here at the front to help you as God speaks to your heart. God, I thank you for your word. And Lord, how these last seven weeks you have spoken to our hearts about real life issues where we struggle and you have real answers where there's hope for us so God I pray that you'll encourage these this morning who, 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 who've who been stuck in their failure and to see the hope that there is in Christ and it'll come this morning make their commitment as you speak to their